Good morning. I am going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, that's towards the back end of the Bible. And uh, we started a series many months ago going through the book of Galatians. And for obvious reasons, uh, because of the, the way things transpired with um, COVID-19 and, and all the different challenges that went along with that, we have taken, taken a few pauses. And now we're getting back to the book of Galatians. And that really means that today we're going to reacquaint ourselves um, with Paul and with this letter that he wrote to the church of Galatia. And um, so today is going to be a little bit of a recap, and then uh, next week we'll start working from where we left off. So I'm going to ask you to find chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2. The apostle Paul is arguing to the church of Galatia about the the centrality and the purity of the gospel. Um, If you read chapter one, you will see that nothing is more valuable, more beautiful, more uh, important for the Apostle Paul to defend than the gospel. It is a priority in every way for him and something that he is looking to hold fast to and hold the church accountable and what is the gospel? Well, it's that, there, that we are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That it's not of works lest any man should boast. And even the law that was given to us was given to us to drive us to an understanding that we are in need of a Savior. And that Jesus Christ is and always will be that Savior. And so there were some arguments that came out of the Jewish community. And in this passage, it's called the circumcision group. And that's because they held very strictly to the law. And they said, listen, if you want to become a child of God, not only do you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you need to have surgery. It wasn't a great church growth plan. But they were wanting those that were Gentiles to come into an understanding of the law and how they needed to practice the law. And so in order to be saved, you needed to believe in Jesus Christ and you also needed to continue to take up the law and follow the law. And then if you do those two things, you will be saved. And so they had a couple arguments and and they pushed back on Paul when he said, no, 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 it's not about keeping the law, it's about in faith accepting the Savior, Jesus Christ. That, That he has finished and completed the work of the law. And so what happened is they were upset and they said um, that, that, that he should not seek to have them undo the law for the law is holy and it's given to them by God and, and that if someone were to become a child of God, certainly they need to follow the law. And so they, they were upset with his thinking. And then they also thought that it would cause... Um, licensed living, living out of the flesh, living out of a way in which it didn't matter if they followed and walked with the Lord. And they said, you know, you're going to be, live a life of lasciviousness, right? And, and so those were the two arguments that kept coming up from the, the church of Galatia to Paul when he talked about Christ alone being the answer in the gospel. Now, what Paul is trying to explain in the book of Galatians is this. The law is given by God, and the law is good. But the primary purpose of the law is that it is a diagnostic tool, not a cure for your sin. And so, just like if I were to realize I, I have, just say, a, a growth on I me mean, and I'm concerned about it. And the doctor says, I'm concerned about it too. Let's get an MRI. I can go there and get that MRI and it'll make all these crazy noises and take all of these pictures. But here's what the MRI will not do. It may diagnose the fact that yes, you have a tumor that is cancerous, but it cannot cure me of my disease. All it can do is diagnose the fact that I am sick or not. And in a sense, that's what the law was given to us for. The law diagnoses the fact that, yes, you do not measure up to a holy God. You need a savior. And so Paul here is arguing, hey, the law and obedience to the law is important. But the fact of the matter, we were given the law 
as a tool of diagnosis to realize that on our own, we could never attain the purity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it even talks about here in chapter two that Peter, one of the pillars of the faith, was being opposed by Paul for his misuse of the gospel. So let's start in verse 11. And it says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. If before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's another name, the Greek name for Peter, Before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And so he is is challenging here Peter, and he's saying, listen, Peter, first of all, you're acting racist. You have some type of moral, religious superiority over these new Christians. And you're picking it up from the circumcision group. Because that's not how God spoke to you. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, God came very specifically to Peter and he taught Peter that there was freedom now from the law, that Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, that Jesus Christ was the ultimate cleansing. And they were no longer under the moral code of the law. They no longer had to follow the cleansing Uh, aspects of the law as far as what their diet was and what they would wear. And, And the law, the moral code of the law was very, very specific in those areas. It was very, very specific in letting them understand the fact that that God is very holy and that they do not measure up to God. And so they went through many different ways in which they would make sure that they were ceremonially clean. And so for some of them, uh, that meant every day that they got up, they, they made sure that they bathed a certain way. It meant that they made sure that they didn't eat certain things. It meant that they made sure of the fact that they would not wear blended clothing. They would not touch mold or mildew. They would make sure that they may, would not touch a dead body. They would make sure that in every way when they came to worship, they were cleansed. Now here's the interesting point. Even though they spent all of this time cleansing themselves, making sure that they were ready, making sure that they were separated, making sure that they were pure, when they got before the priest in the temple, what did they have to do? They had to have a sacrifice. A blood sacrifice. Why? Because all the cleansing and preparation in the world meant that they still weren't holy enough to stand before God. And so what they had to accept was the fact that they needed an ultimate sacrifice. They needed an ultimate Passover lamb, and that was Jesus Christ. And so no longer is there any burnt sacrifices needed because Jesus Christ is the, the lamb that died for the sins of the world. And there also isn't any more cleansing sacrifices needed because Jesus Christ has blotted out their sin if they accepted him as their Lord and Savior. And they have been washed and purified completely and totally. This was a radical gospel for them. And the problem was is that the circumcision group sat there and they thought about this and they said, you gotta be kidding me. How are we not better than a Gentile? We have been given the law by God on how to stay separate, on how to stay pure. And so we do all of these things, and when we do these things, we make God happy. And if they're not doing those things, then obviously they're not making God happy. So we are better than them. And Paul here is saying, no, because it's not about what you do, it's about what Jesus Christ has done, what Christ has accomplished for you on your behalf. 
and the law was given to you to bring you to this point. There is no amount of do that can get you righteous before a holy God. It's only in Jesus Christ that we boast. It's only in Jesus Christ that we find our cleansing, that we find our purity, that we find a a satisfying sacrifice to the Lord. And so here, this racial superiority was being called out. And I think it's interesting that what Paul could have done is he could have started out and said, Hey, Peter, do you know how many verses there are in the Bible that speak against racism? And there were plenty. And he could have said, you need to go to this verse, and you need to go to this verse, and you need to go to this verse, and you need to think about this, and you need to, and and he could have put him on a major guilt trip on all of the verses that say that he shouldn't act like that. And that would have been prudent, and that would have been understandable, but that's not where Paul went. Where did Paul go? Paul went straight to the gospel. He said, listen, what you really need is not some type of a moral change. You need to understand the gospel. That that reminds me very clearly of the fact that we need to be teaching ourselves the gospel all the time. We don't grow away or up from the gospel. We have this thought sometimes that the gospel is for people to come to Christ, and after that, we've outgrown the gospel, or newly saved people, or people that fall back into a deep sin, and we can remind ourselves again of the gospel, but other than that, we kind of move beyond it. It's like baby food for the Christian. No, no, it's not. Here, you specifically have Paul, a pillar of the faith, coming to Peter, a pillar of the faith, an apostle, and he's saying, listen, what you need to do is understand the gospel. What do you mean I need to understand the gospel? I had a vision on a rooftop. Did you have that? No, but you've obviously forgotten it. How do you know I've forgotten it? Because you're a racist, and you wouldn't act that way if you understood the gospel. You see, what we are realizing is that what God is speaking through the Apostle Paul to this group of Judaizers and here specifically even to Peter is that he's acting like a hypocrite because at one time he understood the freedom that was in Christ. And now because of the the pressure of another group because he is in some ways a people pleaser. He is now forgetting the freedom that he had in Christ and he is picking back up the chains of the law and starting to wrap himself back up into it and saying, I can only be approved by God if I act, not if I rest in what has been accomplished for me. And so he used to eat with the Gentiles. He used to understand in freedom how God saw the Gentiles and was not making it hard for them to come to Christ. And yet, because of his need to make sure that other people approved of him, he in judgment looked down on them just like the circumcision group. And here Paul is saying, you've forgotten the gospel. You're not living in line and in light of the gospel. Look at verse 16. It's really the the heart of the gospel. He says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if an endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners in Christ, then a servant of sin, certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. What is the the heart of the gospel? Well, it's, it's not salvation by works of the law, but it is salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Obedience, is that important? 
Was there concern that if someone just lives in light of faith alone in Christ, that they would turn to, to, to um, some type of a wild lifestyle that didn't give any concern for the law or didn't give any concern? No, 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 no. What, what, what he is saying is, no, of course there's obedience. We're, in verse 17, he says that, that we're not servants of sin. That's not the goal. The gospel sends lines to our lives and it says that if you know Christ, obviously there's going to be a change. Obviously there's going to be a fruit of the spirit that comes out of you and you're going to desire to do God's will. But it is not doing God's will that saves you. It's a result of being saved that you do the will of God. And they were getting this backwards The gospel helps correct our lives. We need to teach ourselves and understand the fact that we are sinners, but we have been saved by the grace of God. That Jesus Christ came down and he took my sin and he's given me his righteousness. He took my feebleness and he's given me his power. And begin to live in light of that. Now, let me ask you, in your work, are you living in line with the gospel? With how you spend your money? Are you living in line with the gospel? With your family and how you're rearing them and, and, and trusting God to lead you? Are you living in line with the gospel? What about your sexuality? Some people's identity is all wrapped up in their sexuality. My whole identity is, I am heterosexual. I am homosexual. I am bisexual. No, if you're a child of God, you are in Christ. Your identity is not in your sexuality. Your identity is not in your job. Your identity is not in your family. Your identity is in Christ, in the finished work of Christ. What about your attitude towards the poor and needy? Is it in line with the gospel? That that you yourself were impoverished, broken, dirty, needy, and you had a savior that came down from heaven to save and give you a, a saving and redeeming hand and pull you up out of the miry pit and wash you clean. Now, how do you turn to a poor person and say, ha, get a job. We understand by the gospel how we are to to live and how we are to serve. What about, you might say, I I really believe the gospel. I, I hold on to the gospel, but you haven't let go of that thing that happened in your past. It's still just grabbing around you like a boa constrictor. It still defines your life. And the first thing you think of when someone says, you're a, a beloved child of God is, yeah, but... Yeah, but I did this. Yeah, but this happened in my life. Yeah, but I made this critical mistake. Yeah, but you don't know my fatal flaw. Yeah, but you don't know the sin struggle that I still have in my life. Yeah, no, that's not the gospel. So just like Paul here is correcting Peter and he's saying, Peter, are you living in line and in liberty with the gospel? I don't think you are or you wouldn't treat someone as below you because in the gospel we have all realized that we are sinners broken before a holy God and we've been united only through him. What about politics? It's an election year. Things are heating up. How do you think about someone who views the world in a political way different than you? You don't have to be so caustic when you understand and see yourself in the way that God sees you through the lens of the gospel. And so the gospel is so beautiful and the gospel is so powerful because in one way it is so infinitely broad. It speaks to every single issue in life. Everything that I do, when I look at it through the lens of the gospel, it changes how I attack it. It changes how I live through it. It changes how I will find joy in the midst of it. 
So it's broad in that, but it's, it's also infinitely deep. It, it satisfies my deepest need. The gospel truly does satisfy my concerns, my worries. And here's the issue. Order matters when it comes to understanding the freedom that we have in Christ. And what was going on with the church in Galatia, if you remember, think back many months ago, we talked about how the order that they were taking the gospel in was not the gospel, it was legalism. And it was this, first of all, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul and the circumcision group both agreed there. Yes, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. They both believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They both believe that he is what is needed for them to have eternal life. So they're on even playing field right there. Yes, Christ. Then number two is where the big switch is. The second thing that the Judaizers would believe would be this. I keep the law. So I, in faith, believe in Jesus Christ. Then I keep the law. And then thirdly, I'm saved. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not, I believe in Jesus, I keep the law, and then I'm saved. The order is wrong. The gospel is this, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm saved because I have faith in Jesus Christ, and that enables me and encourages me, and I am blessed to be obedient to the Lord. That is the gospel, and that's what Paul is trying to correct here. And, and if you do not get that order correct, if, if you do not realize that I obey because I am accepted as opposed to I am accepted by God because I obey, if you flip the order, then guess what? You will live a life that is anxious. And do you know how many Christians I speak to throughout a year that are very, very anxious as children of God? Pastor, I don't have security in my salvation. Pastor, I worry about where I'm going to spend eternity, even though I can recite the Romans road to you. Pastor, I am anxious in how God sees me and how God views me. And I think that God is eternally disappointed with me. You're misplacing the gospel. You think it's works and then salvation, but it never is. It's faith in Christ, salvation that leads to the works of the Spirit being bore out in your life. And so we live anxious lives when we get this messed around. The other thing is we live selfish lives because the fact of the matter is everything we do is self-based. I obey God. Why? For me. So that you think I'm a good pastor. So that you think, wow, what a holy and good person that is. Who is getting the kickback on this whole thing? Me. What's it all about? Me. This happens. I went to seminary with guys studying to go into ministry. But the reason they were studying to go into ministry was really just all about their self-righteousness, not about the glory of God and the mission of the kingdom of God. And it fell to ruin. But they were patted on the back a long time ago by a well-meaning person in the church that said, boy, you really have talents. You should go into the ministry. No, you should get saved. And so we realize that when this is backwards, the two things and fruit that we bear out of that is anxiousness and selfishness. Let me ask you, what grows on your tree? Is it anxiousness? Is it selfishness? Or is it the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering. That will tell you if you're really a child of God. That will tell you if the coin has dropped and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't tell me what you've done. Tell me what your faith lies in. Faith is that Christ is enough, and in him we have everything. Love, intimacy, a guaranteed future, joy. This is not a duty relationship. This is a delight relationship. 
Do I follow the law of Christ? Not perfectly, but I love the law and I want to obey it because I really believe that God's law is the best thing for me. It brings flourishing and it glorifies him. It is not a duty that I fulfill, but it's a delight. Let, let's just say you were one of those unfortunate ladies that um, in your high school days were getting ready for prom and you hoped that Joe would ask you to the prom. But instead, Sam got there first. And he said, would you go to the prom with me? And you said, yeah, mom, what do I have to do? And she said, you need to do the right thing. You need to go with Sam or you can't go at all. Well, you really want to go to the prom but you didn't want to go with him. So what do you do? Out of duty, so that you could make your mom happy, and out of duty, because you really wanted to go to the prom, you go with Sam. But are you enjoying yourself? Not really. Are you really, really trying to, well, every once in a while, I, I, I try to be polite, and we'll go do, you know, sit and talk, and I'll sit next to him at the meal, but most of the time, I'm just hanging out with my friends, and most of the time, I'm really looking at the person that I wanted to be at the prom with. Sometimes our salvation is kind of like that. If it's duty-based, if it's legalism-based, there's not joy in that. It, it, it's kind of like, well, I really want to get to heaven, and so I got to follow Jesus. But I'm not happy about it because I really want to live my life. I don't want to be crucified to my own life and live for Christ, but instead I'd rather still live for me. And so I, I do some good works because I want to get to heaven and I do some good things because I want God to like me. But at the end of the day, this whole thing is a big duty. It's a big bore. It's a big challenge. Listen, if that is your Christian walk, you don't know the gospel. You're legalistically, dutifully performing, but you're not enjoying the riches that God died on the cross to give you. And that's the case here. And that's why this book is so important to all of us because here's the deal. I have met many, many, many people that could pass the quiz do you know the gospel? Tell me what justification is. Yes, I can tell you what justification is. Hey, tell me what, tell me, tell me what um, the, the propitiation of Jesus Christ is, and I can do that. I can talk to you about atonement. I can pass the quiz, but you're not living in the richness and fullness and joy and delight of the gospel. And just as it passionately challenged Paul to share with Peter and to the Judaizers, I hope that as we go through this book together, it'll encourage you, it'll challenge you, it'll stretch you. And we realize that in Christ, all the scriptures are completed. That, that he is the Passover lamb that satisfied the holy wrath of God. And we cannot add to in any way what he has completed, what he has finished. It was ultimately completed and perfectly finished. It's not like my car. I wash my car and for some reason, the next time I drive it, there is like a bug swarm on the road. And I'm driving and just hear splat, 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 splat. And I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta rewash it. Go home, scrub it up again. You know, some of us, that's the way we kind of live our Christian life. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, God's disappointed in me. Now I got to clean myself up. Drive again. It's, ah, oh, now I'm, uh, no, we have been forever cleaned. Past, present, and future, all sins scrubbed away, washed away. We are pure in Christ. Is not that good news? So when I stand before God, he does not see Brian, you messed up person. He says, Jesus Holy, righteous, pure, come in. Do I deserve it? No. Is that the gift that's been given me? Yes, and you too. 
Now that is motivation to say, if God loved me that much, then what he tells me I should do with my life is probably out of a heart of love and out of something that I should take delight in doing because it's going to have everlasting impact and joy and satisfaction in my own life. Peter knew the gospel, but the problem was it didn't penetrate his heart at this time in his walk. Has the gospel penetrated your heart? You say, I don't know. Here's one way that I think it's a good gospel litmus test. Are you on an enduring hunt for value, for, for, for worth? Are you desperate in your need to be validated? Why do we have this hunger for of the approval of others, just like Peter did here? Because deep inside, we're afraid that we don't have value. Deep inside, we're afraid we don't measure up. Deep inside, we know that we're broken. And so we have this hunger for people to tell us, no, I'm okay. Or we we have this superiority where we think it's okay to look down on other people and be racist. We we have this idea that that, um, we want everyone to see our achievements and tell us that we're doing a good job and that we're validated. You know, the reason why romance is so powerful and and palpable is because all of us in some level feel vindicated we feel valued we feel special to somebody your career some of you that that is what your validation is look what i do look what i've done in the past look at the trophies that i have Your, the gospel is this, your value is not something that you've earned, it's something that you've received. And your value is in Jesus Christ. I have been made valuable because Christ has saved me. I've been made beautiful because Christ is beautiful. The hunt for validation is over when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. You don't have to fear the circumcision group, Peter, because you have worth in the eyes of Christ. You have acceptance in the finished work of Jesus Christ. What does he say in verses 20 and 21? I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I've been crucified with Christ. That means I've, I, I've, I've died. My sinful self is now dead. It's not alive. It's not able to rule and reign in my life. Colossians 3.1 says that I've also been raised with Christ. The moment I believe, I'm united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. So by faith, when I accepted Christ, I'm united with him in his death. I I died on that cross with him. And so before God, my sins have been paid for. Why? Because I've died with Christ. The blood of Christ covered me. And then I'm also raised with Christ. I'm given the same honors as Christ. The medals that should have gone on Christ's chest have now been pinned on my chest of sinlessness, of righteousness, of pure and good. Christ is treated as though he had done everything that I have done in the past that was sinful, that was broken, that is wicked, and everything I will do that is sinful, that is broken, and that is wicked. And I'm treated as if I have accomplished all the things that Christ did, living a sinless life, fulfilling the law perfectly and wholly. Is your life in line with the gospel? Do you see that when you look at your life. Are you judging others? You don't understand the gospel. Do you still need to be validated? You don't understand the gospel. Are you afraid to die? You don't understand the gospel. Are you still living a powerless Christian life? Then you don't understand 
the gospel. It says this, though, and this is a challenge for us. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Part of faith in Jesus Christ is this. I die to myself. Have you been crucified with Christ? Have you died to your dream and instead taken on his? Have you died to your desire to be known and patted on the back and cheered and acknowledged? Or have you traded that in to make him known, to make him celebrated? to cause others to know him. Jeremiah says this, those who seek me with their whole heart will find me. That's what being crucified with Christ is. It's this, I am dying to myself and with my whole heart, I am seeking God. I have talked to many and at times in my own life have understood the fact that why is it stale? Why do I not feel close to God? Why does he feel so far from me? It's this, you're not seeking him with your whole heart. God is not okay with being an addition, a little spice to your life something that you add to it. He wants to be the very center of your solar system. Everything revolves around him. He is the sun. You are but a planet that goes around him. Uh, He can't just be a garnish that you put into your life that just beautifies it a little bit. Look, here's my little Jesus. Jesus but he is the ultimate aspect of your life. And and here's the beautiful thing. When you truly understand the gospel and when you truly see Christ as more beautiful than anything else, it allows you to disappear. I can be crucified. I don't have to fight for me. I don't have to be noticed or seen or celebrated. I can disappear, why? Because Christ is ultimately beautiful. And finding more about him and mining out the riches of the gospel that he has given me is more joyful than any applause that I could get for my own life, my own story, and my own way. There was a, a woman that I had a conversation with and she um, went through a horrible breakup. And for a long period of time, she said, I, I don't think I can ever date. I don't think I can ever trust a guy again. Kind of working through her with this heart pain and this hurt. And if you've ever been through something like that, you know it is a kick in the gut. And then she said something very profound. She said, Pastor, I made a mistake. My justification for living, my value, my, 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 the way that I felt good about myself was all wrapped up in him, in this relationship. And I was wrong. And now I'm finding my value in Christ. And now I'm finding my value and hope in what he has accomplished. And it's not just wrapped up in a guy. And I said, now you're ready to date again. (laughs) Because you understand the freedom of the gospel. Listen. If my validation comes from being a good dad, a good husband, a good pastor, if it comes from leading this church and hearing applause from that, if it comes from hearing my kids say, you're the best dad ever, then here's what will happen. I will use them and I will use you, period. But if 
My value is in Jesus Christ alone. And I don't need the applause of you. And I don't need the applause of my family. But instead, I just love them. I'm free to love them because my value is in Christ and Christ alone. And I'm free to tell them the hard things that they don't want to hear. Because my value is in Christ and Christ alone. So, has the coin dropped for you? Are you still fighting for, see me? I want to live. And a person that understands the gospel can fade away and say, see him. Look what he's done. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I am keenly aware of the fact that if an apostle, Peter, had to be reminded of the fresh good news of the gospel, so do we. And so as we go through this book, Lord, would you challenge us and grow us and will we be willing to be crucified with Christ so that we can ultimately live. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen.